Hi everybody, my name is Dennis Keating and I'm going to be your teacher for the Gospel of John here. This is New Testament 354, it's a level 3 uh, New Testament class and um, I'm just thrilled to be uh, starting with you and I'm really looking forward to getting to see you and getting to know you uh, face to face up there during the intensive week. And so uh, this introductory video is meant to uh, give you a little bit of background and a little bit of insight into who I am as a person and a little bit of the background of the Gospel of John that will kind of set the course uh, for your reading, for your memory, for the discussion board questions and everything that's going to go on in this class. So let me just sufficiently say that I'm thrilled, <laughs> thrilled to be with you and uh, can't wait to meet you personally, find out a little bit more of your story and how the Lord Jesus has worked in your life. And I pray this will be a really, really meaningful time for you. I hope it'll be the best class you take while you're at the, at the Bible College. So let's begin with a word of prayer and then we'll uh, dig in and I'll tell you a little bit about myself and um, off we go. All right, so join me in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you most of all for your son just can't say it enough and say it often enough uh, Lord Jesus we love you and we praise you because of your sacrifice upon the cross and through your Holy Spirit and through your word we pray now that uh, our time together would be uh, beneficial as we study this we ask you O Holy Spirit to be our teacher our guide into all the truth as you have promised and that through it all, uh, Lord Jesus, that you would be honored, and Father, that you would be glorified by that. So I pray for my sisters and brothers uh, here in this class that we together might grow and learn. I pray that you would help me grow and learn as well. So speak to us. We would commit to you this entire class and everything that's involved in it, and really do from our hearts want to grow and uh, know you better. So we thank you again for your word and again, I trust uh, this time to you now and ask for your blessing and guidance in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, uh, uh, let's get started and we'll just uh, dig right in. Let me just give you a little bit of uh, introduction uh, to the class and a little bit as to who I am. Um, uh, my family is obviously really important to me and everything that I'm, I'm doing and everything that I've done. But uh, more than anything else, uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about m my life. Uh, uh, my life verse is uh, Galatians 2.20. Not everybody has life verses, but this was the first verse I ever memorized. Um, I got saved in between my freshman and sophomore years in college. And I was very privileged to grow up in a devout uh, Roman Catholic family. And my older sister was the first to hear about uh, what I call the soft side of God, the, the gospel message. She was the first to respond to it, and she had a profound influence on me. Uh, she got involved with uh, Young Life's ministry in high school and then went on staff with them. And it was through her influence that I ended up at... Uh, uh, Forced Home Christian Conference Center, where I heard the gospel for the first time and uh, placed my faith and my trust in Christ. That was in 1972, so over 50 years ago. So I, I praise the Lord, and uh, this verse has just guided me. So if you want to know anything about me, it's really in this verse. I have been crucified with Christ, and so it's that union, that identification that I experienced with him. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So the old Dennis died. I was united with Christ, and it's his life in me now that I live by faith in this flesh, the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. And that becomes the great motivation of my life. I have a, 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 a principle that I've tried to follow, and it's called Thanks Driven Obedience where every single day it's my opportunity to say thank you to the Lord Jesus for loving me and giving himself up for me so that everything that I do, everything that I say, and really everything that I am uh, is an opportunity, a thank offering, if you will, 
according to Hebrews chapter 13, uh, something that really honors him. So every day I'm not trying to earn his uh, favor. I've already received it. And now it's just my opportunity to say thank you back to him in everything that I do. And so uh, even in this class, I pray it's a giant thank offering to him. Uh, my ministry life verse is in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. Uh, the things that you have learned from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Um, I'm about multiplication. It's why I'm teaching at, uh, the, at the Bible College here. The things that I have learned, I have tried to pass on to others, uh, many witnesses. And over my time and my, my life, I've been really fortunate to see many of those witnesses that I've entrusted things to go on and to entrust them to other faithful people, women and men, who would then be able to teach even others also. So in, in this verse, it, it describes the multiplying process that I hope the things that I've learned from the study of the book of John can be passed on to you so that you can grow and you can develop and learn to love the Lord Jesus even more and then pass those truths on to those that you are discipling and ministering to so that they too can pass them on to others. So the whole goal of this is our knowledge of the Lord, but then a multiplication out. And if that happens, then uh, this class will have been very, very beneficial. And I hope a, a great blessing through it all. So that's a little bit about my, my ministry passions. Um, as I mentioned to you, it's my family that really is the great passion of my life. My dear wife, Marcia, and I have been married um, 44 years. So we'll hit 45 this next year. We have three adult kids. They're the three in the front of the picture, our oldest son, Sean, our, uh, my daughter Courtney is next to him, and this is my youngest son, Bryce, their spouses, and we have eight grain kids uh, that range from age uh, 15 down to uh, one. Our little one-year-old Cashel, little boy, I just celebrated his uh, first birthday last week, so uh, it's just a real blessing to have this crew and my wife's been with me for you know we're getting close to the five decade mark so just part of the the great blessing of the lord uh I, in ministry i served at uh emmanuel faith community church in escondido and after i got saved uh, in 1972 i started uh actively in in ministry uh trying to grow and learn myself and then pass those truths on to others I worked with Youth for Christ in San Diego. I did my undergraduate work in accounting. I was head in corporate, and uh, the Lord really got a hold of my life uh, in my junior and senior year in college and ended up at Talbot Theological Seminary, uh, which is on Biola's campus, and uh, started into the ministry. Uh, worked with junior high kids, worked with high school kids, and then when I came to Emmanuel Faith in Escondido, I worked for 10 years as a college pastor. And then my uh, our senior pastor uh, uh, was diagnosed with cancer and he passed and the church asked if I would take on uh, those additional responsibilities. And so I was really privileged. I spent 40 years in one church, which is just really a great blessing. All that means is that it's a very, very gracious congregation. Uh, so I, I've done a little bit of everything. Uh, this is year four in my teaching at uh, Calvary Chapel Bible College. Uh, I've done the, the uh, pastoral epistles, done the Gospel of Mark, and this is my first pass through the Gospel of John. So um, I retired from my lead pastor role at Emmanuel Faith in uh, 2019, so uh, four years ago. But I didn't retire from the ministry. I developed a new ministry called Grateful Shepherd Ministries. I just had to ask myself, what am I? And I'm just a grateful shepherd is all. And what I do now is I preach, I teach, I mentor, and I lead. So I'm preaching in churches a couple times a month. Um, I, I'm teaching here at uh, 
the Bible college and then also at another Bible college up in Oregon. Uh, I mentor young pastors uh, and folks who are uh, in the ministry. And then uh, churches will call me and say, hey, can you give us some insight organizationally, uh, vision, mission, et cetera, et cetera, that I get to do that occasionally as well. So um, my website is gratefulshepherdministries.org. I send out a weekly um, little uh, uh, devotional. It's called Monday Morning Perspective, and I spell morning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. Just a short little devotional to give us some uh, positive input from the scriptures and uh, give us some hope for each week. And so if you go onto my website, you can find out a little bit more about who I am, what I'm about. There are all kinds of sermons on there as well as preaching calendar. But if you just remember Grateful Shepherd Ministries, that's really what I'm doing now. So uh, uh, for hobbies, I'm, I'm kind of all things athletic. Um, I like basketball. I like body surfing. I like pretty much anything having to do with um, athletics. Um, and uh, I do woodworking as a hobby. So I can take $100 worth of wood and turn it into $12 worth of furniture with the best of them. So uh, there are some things now that I can do for people. Helpful. And I'm just really excited. So that's a, a little bit uh, about me and about what I'm all about. So let's uh, get on into all of this and, uh, and start really with a little review of the course requirements. What you will need for our time in this uh, introduction is you'll definitely need a, a, a copy of the syllabus either up on uh, your screen or have access to it in some way. Uh, you'll need a, uh, a Bible, obviously. I'm, I use the New American Standard Bible, the update edition, 1995. There was a new update in 2020, but I just I use the NASB updated. You can use any Bible that you want, but I just need you to know the one that I'm going to be using. The NIV is great. The ESV is great. I like the, the New American Standard because it is the closest in its translation to the original text. It's not always as readable as, say, the NIV or the ESV, but it gives you, uh, via the punctuation, etc., the closest things, and you have to do some understanding and interpreting to make it readable. But um, I really like the NASB. It's always been my go-to study Bible. And that's the one that we're going to be using, okay? Um, the other things that you'll need is these uh, is an outline of the time. Each one of our classes will have an outline for you to uh, download. Uh, there will also be PowerPoints for you to download. There'll be an outline of this introduction as well as a PowerPoint that you can download. And I think it will be helpful to you. I'm a visual person, and if I can see things, it helps me understand them a little bit better. So you'll, you'll need your New American Standard Bible. You'll need that outline. Uh, you'll need the PowerPoint up. And then um, also that, that having that syllabus during this class will be uh, really, really important. The reading that we're going to be doing and the commentary that we're going to be reading from is uh, D.A. Carson's work in the Pillar New Testament series just called the Gospel of John. I can't see this too well on that screen. But it's uh, D.A. Carson, the Gospel of John, Pillar New Testament commentary. And uh, uh, it's available on Logos. And so I would encourage you, you can look at for it there. Um, but the reason why I'm choosing this is that it's challenging reading. Uh, D.A. Carson is probably the go-to commentary for most people in ministry who are teaching through uh, uh, John's Gospel. It is an intermediate to somewhat advanced kind of a commentary, and I think you should have access to it and some familiarity to it in this third level year level class. So um, I picked it because of its scope of information he touches on pretty much every subject that uh, John is dealing with 
especially in the background. It'll be some challenging reading in spots for you, but you do not need to have a prerequisite in Greek, though it does refer to the Greek text throughout this commentary. But I think it's something that you should be aware of. And so uh, with this D.A. Carson reading, you'll see in the syllabus on your assignments, there's a, a page assignment for you to read. And uh, for this very first class, what I'd like for you to do before we meet is I want you to read through the entire Gospel of John in uh, one sitting, preferably, uh, before the, uh, the, this first class. So it would be really helpful for you to be familiar with the text itself. And then you'll also see in on the syllabus here your reading assignment for this first class here and the pages of uh, page 1 to page 110. And I put down skim pages 23 through uh, 87 because there's uh, a lot of background information here. The Gospel of John has been dissected and studied for uh, 2,000 years. And there's a tremendous amount of input and debate and discussion and disagreement about this gospel that you just need to be familiar with. And so once you get into uh, Carson's writings, you'll see that he is very, very deep and can give some broad scope of background information. And I just want you to be familiar with it, okay? What I really want you to focus in on is uh, the purpose, that's pages 87 through 94, and the theological themes, pages 95 through 100. Those are the ones that I really want you to focus in on because your discussion board questions will be related to that purpose and the theme for this uh, first week's assignment. So. If you look in the syllabus, you'll see when everything is due, read the Gospel of John, watch this introductory video. The discussion board question number one, we'll go over that in just a, a second here, commentary reading, all right? So uh, let's just uh, go through the, the aims then. So you'll need your Bible. You'll need uh, D.A. Carson's uh, commentary, the Pillar New Testament series here, the Gospel according to John. Uh, my goals and aims are stated there for student learning. At the top of the list is that you grow deeper in your love for the Lord Jesus. That's what this is all about. It's not just about head knowledge, it's about heart knowledge. And for our love and our appreciation for who he is and what he has done. Uh, I will want to be able to identify, summarize, and explain the purpose, themes, and major sections of uh, Jesus' ministry as recorded in John's Gospel. Uh, there's a number of different outlines, and we'll get to that here in just a little bit. But I, I want you to be really familiar so that you would be able to give the, the broad themes of this wonderful, wonderful text. Um, the, to understand the theological implications of Jesus' deity, because that's what this Gospel uh, focuses on, is on the Son of God and to be able to explain those theological implica uh, implications through the signs, the, the, the miracles, through the, the statements. And um, I hope you'll come away with a deep assurance that you're saved and that the Lord Jesus has you. Um, that's my heart prayer, to be able to understand, explain, and better experience the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Um, there's a significant section in the Gospel of John uh, chapters 13 through 17, and really chapters 14, 15, and 16, has great detail about the Holy Spirit's ministry. And it's going to be one of the themes that we'll focus in on, understanding who he is and how he works and what he does and what his purpose is and his role is in the Trinity. So pretty exciting. And then be able to apply the, the teaching and lessons to uh, life and ministry. So I hope it will be practical for you. And uh, I'll look forward to uh, interacting uh, with you about it. Okay, so those are the goals and the aims. Let's review for just a minute the, the uh, course assignments here. 
Um, you'll see in the, again, in the syllabus, attendance, 15% uh, of your grade is going to be just showing up. And that's obviously applicable in the um, intensive week. But more than anything else, I want you, it's going to be participation and uh, um, engagement really are the key. So um, again, not just head knowledge, this, this is about the heart. And that's what I, I want to most communicate to you. That, that my desire is that you grow individually and not just be able to spew back information, but then in your heart, you really, really will grow. So uh, engage in this, but uh, attendance is a big part. Uh, there will be discussion board questions there. Uh, Lord willing, the plan is for you to have a discussion board question on Monday. And that'll give you a few days then, and you can read in here in the course requirements of, of a 200-word response to that discussion board question. This is for you personally. It's a personal response for you. And then in addition to your own personal response, there'll be two other students that you'll need to respond to as well. And so there will be a, a chat room of some kind where you will go online and can respond to other people's personal response and the, uh, to the, the uh, discussion board question. That response to others will be a uh, 100 words and uh, it'll all be graded based on content and thoughtfulness and uh, obviously in discussion about the the question and the information and, and insights given in the commentary. So um, that we won't have groups that you will be in throughout the whole time together here. So uh, try to go on to a variety of people's uh, response uh, board and respond to different people at different times. And you read through, if you have any questions, my email and my phone number are up on that, on that syllabus. So I'd be, I'd be happy to interact with you um, on all of that. But uh, so your discussion board questions are a good chunk of this class and the way that you interact because it's going to be about your reading. Uh, the third area is your weekly reading assignments. And we've already covered that a bit. You'll just see what you'll need to read in the, uh, in the commentaries. I'll ask you to read through the Gospel of John a second time and you'll see when that is due also in the syllabus. So there's going to be a significant amount of reading here. Uh, the next thing are memory verses. And there's going to be 16 verses that I want you to memorize. My guess is that you already have a lot of them. But I'm a big Bible memory uh, person. It has really impacted my life. And so you'll see how we're going to grade them here. I just want you to write each one out 10 times and, and uh, email it to me. And uh, you're, I'm not going to, I just want you to try to memorize these verses. This is for you. This is not for a grade. This is just for you. And so if you, if you mess up a word here or there, uh, don't worry about that. I just really want you to try to get it right. And uh, every verse just needs to be written out 10 times. And if you do uh, copy and paste, uh, you got a bigger problem, all right? Because uh, I'm just going to ask you to be honest here and really try to memorize these verses, okay? And we'll just uh, keep that all above board. Uh, you'll see the next thing is the term paper. And I, I've listed uh, seven different issues that you can choose one of the following. So either a conversation with Jesus. It's one of the unique things about the Gospel of John. He records a lot of individual conversations that aren't in the other uh, Gospels. Uh, Nicodemus, the uh, Pharisees, the Samaritan woman, uh, the paralytic, the Mary and Martha. There, there's a lot of people that he uh, has discussion with. So you could pick that one. You could pick a theological theme on the deity of Christ or the ministry of the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to believe the, the death, uh, resurrection, and salvation? I mean, there's a lot of these themes that will start to develop.
but uh, you could pick one of those. Uh, the titles of Jesus here, Son of God, Son of Man, the Word, Messiah, Lamb of God. Um, you'll see uh, seven I am statements. I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You could do uh, uh, your term paper on the I am statements. You could do them on the seven miraculous signs. John builds his gospel around those signs. Uh, you could do something on the historic setting and the impact of uh, John's writing. Uh, from, from the cultural context of, of when he lived and when he was writing this gospel. And then there's a number of textual issues that you could write about that we'll talk about. So um, I tried to give you some, a broad f flexibilities on whatever it is that you think would be most beneficial for you and uh, the things that you might be interested in. And then uh, off we go. You can see the paper requirements and all the formatting things are according to the CCBC uh, style guide. So uh, you know what all that is. Then um, final exam is uh, going to be 15% of your grade. It's going to be 100 um, multiple uh, choice questions. You'll have a couple hours to do it and um, uh, the, it'll all come right off the PowerPoints. So if you're paying attention, uh, it should be really simple, but you'll need to prepare for it, okay? It'll be a challenge. So anyway, you can see the time estimates there on the syllabus and the various components and the weight, and then the module and, and the discussion board questions. So um, you'll have those discussion board questions up on the, on the Monday, and then uh, uh, hopefully you'll get those responses to uh, other people on Wednesday, and then I'll try to get through them all on Friday so that um, we can uh, stay on top of grading and all of that, all right? So the one thing that I would just really encourage you to do, whenever you write anything here for this class, please, please use spell check and grammar check hit that editor button or any of the other software programs that you use, um, please, just because um, it, it's a real simple tool. And um, as you uh, go on in your studies, just being able to write is going to be critically important for you. Okay, so let's just do all of that. All right, okay, so let's dig in now. And uh, if you have any questions, again, Either text me or um, email me, and I'll do my best. I, I put in the syllabus as well uh, some other uh, recommended resources for a variety of your term papers if you were going to look up, because you, you're going to need to use other references. And some are pastoral in their approach, the resources. Others are, are beginning or and intermediate um, uh, commentaries that you could refer to as well. Okay? All right, let's dig into our text now. And again, it'll be really helpful. You can put that syllabus aside and uh, we can take a look now then at the, uh, the outline that you have up in front of you and uh, just dig in just a little bit here for maybe a half an hour or so and see if we can't give you some overall background of how John fits in here, okay? All right, so... Um, as we begin, one of the key questions is, what is a gospel? Because we're going to look at the gospel of John. Uh, the, the Greek word euangelion is uh, translated oftentimes as good news. That's what it literally refers to. It's the good news of salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the way that it's used in a, in a biblical context. But uh, to really understand the gospel, you need to know that it it's more about an oral proclamation than the news itself. Uh, when a, a gospel, an euangelion, was given, it wasn't a debate, it wasn't a discussion, it was really an announcement. An announcement about who Jesus is. So when we talk about Gospels, we're really talking about this oral proclamation of the story 
of Jesus of Nazareth. And that helps us understand a little bit in terms of the writing of the Gospels here. Now, uh, why were they written? Um, primarily, uh, and an accurate account of Jesus' life was needed in that first century. If our Lord died in the 30s AD, uh, th there was a great need for um, historic uh, recording of Jesus' words and Jesus' action. There was an instructional need because converts needed to be trained in those uh, words and in those actions. Uh, there was a, a liturgical need because we need to worship in truth, we're told in John chapter 4. And therefore, truth was needed in order for us to express back to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit uh, worship and adoration and everything that's involved in that. So there was lots of need for uh, these accounts to be written down here. We could talk about uh, an exhortation need. Uh, believers have needed to be encouraged. There was an evangelistic need that the gospel was to be sent out. There was an apologetic need because the gospel was being attacked. So this oral proclamation of who Jesus is and what he did uh, needed to be uh, collated, needed to be recorded, and needed to be put down for an accurate account of our Lord's life. Well, the question then gets asked how this oral proclamation and the need to be written, how it ended up with four Gospels. Well, the process was pretty um, straightforward. All of the historic events, uh, the life, the teachings of Jesus were all given to us via oral traditions. So uh, one decade after our Lord, those stories and his teachings got passed verbally, orally, from one generation to the next to the next. So one decade after another, after another, after another. Well, those oral traditions then, the historic statements, the events, etc., and the oral proclamation of those started getting written down and uh, the the pieces of that writing are, are typically called manuscripts that uh, contain parts of the Jesus story. Others are, are larger sections of the Jesus story. And once they were written down in pieces, uh, then you start to have um, uh, the standardizing of those accounts. And this is what happened. Most people think that the Gospel of Mark was the first one written. Many think he uh, wrote his Gospel uh, in the 50s AD. So 20 years after Jesus' death, burial and resurrection, uh, Mark either in the 50s or 60s. The same with the Gospel of Matthew the same with the Gospel of Luke. Uh, the conservative scholars all date them uh, prior to AD 70. AD 70 is when the Roman army came in and destroyed the temple and destroyed Jerusalem. And uh, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all speak of that event, that proclamation, if you will, as something coming in the future. And so Matthew, Mark, and Luke um, are, are uh, all written pre-70 uh, AD. Now, there are uh, other scholars, and if you go to uh, most major universities and you were to take a Bible class, they would probably say that the, that the Gospels were written far later and were not written by Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but by a group of people. That's the more liberal understanding, but it's the more uh, prominent understanding. Uh, ours is a, a very, very um, accurate 
uh, but just so that you know a conservative view of the scriptures. So the historic events be, became oral traditions that then ultimately writ were written down, and uh, there were a lot of other Gospels written as well. You have the Gospel of Thomas, you have the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, you have a Gospel of Peter, you have a Gospel of Judas. Uh, those were all in the 100 to 200 AD time frame. So um, what happened is that the early church got together and they recognized the inspiration of the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John Gospels. And they canonized those um, at the Council of Hippo, 393 AD. And it's not that they gave them inspiration. They just recognized God's inspiration of those. And so um, this is where we get our, our, our Bible, our Gospels in our Bible, why we have four of them uh, as all part of the canonicity uh, question. And uh, you'll see in Carson's writings, there's lots of information and background on how we got our four Gospels and the differences of opinion on them that I just want you to be somewhat familiar with them, okay? Now, with that said, we've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in our New Testament. Three of them are, are very, very similar. Uh, they're called the Synoptic Gospel, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Syn synoptic means to see with or to view together. And, and in these three, they have very, very similar content, uh, similar construction, similar timeline. They follow the same general outline of Jesus' life. So they, they see Jesus together, that they see it the same way, if, and they contribute, they're, they're interdependent, and each one gives a very unique perspective of who Jesus is. And so if you were to do a study, you'll see that there are only 24 verses in the Gospel of Mark that are not included in Matthew and Luke. So there's a lot of agreement between these synoptic gospels. And there'll be a big section in Carson's commentary on the synoptics and how they're the same and how they're different, which one came first. Many people today think that Mark was the first one written and Matthew and Luke used him as well as other sources in the writing of their gospels. So that probably the main thing that they're similar on is their, their focus of the synoptics is on the kingdom of God. That's where the rule of God, both in the individual lives and on earth, and Jesus coming to present the kingdom of God to the Hebrew people. So they're very, very interdependent, and they give a unique perspective. Now, John's gospel is very, very different than the synoptics. Almost 90% of the material is unique to John. So almost 90% not recorded in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. But I, I just want you to know that different doesn't mean wrong. Uh, most scholars today would ass assume that John was at least acquainted with the Synoptic Gospels. And knowing that the material was already available and uh, it was written, it was uh, circulated, it was widespreadly uh, known, he left out much. So in the Gospel of John, there's no genealogy of Jesus. There's nothing about his birth. There's no exorcisms or casting out of demons. There's no parables. Uh, we don't get a record of the temptation of Jesus or of his baptism or the transfiguration. There's nothing in here about the institution of the Lord's uh, table of communion. Uh, we don't get a list at all of the um, 
we don't get a list of all at all of the of the twelve disciples in John here. So it's really really different in its its recording, and the reason is because we we think he added what they did not record, what are not mentioned here, in order to in many ways supplement those gospels. And so he, uh, five of the eight miracles of John are, are, are not mentioned in the synoptics here. It's the only place that we read about um, Nicodemus, the only place we read about the Samaritan woman, the only place that we get the raising of Lazarus from the dead. The, maybe the most astounding miracle outside of our Lord's own resurrection here. Uh, it's the only place we see the washing of the disciples' feet. It's the only place where we read about doubting Thomas here. So there's a whole early section of Jesus' ministry in Judea and Samaria that the synoptics barely mention. That it's a, it's a large part of John's gospel here. So this was, this was meant to complement. This was meant to supplement. And uh, if we understand the traditions of the church and we understand the early writings accurately here, John's uh, purpose was to write a spiritual gospel. Uh, Clement of Alexander, he, Alexandria uh, in Egypt, he, he was uh, 150 to 215 AD here. He's quoted by Eusebius. Eusebius is uh, 265 to 3 something AD, uh, saying that um, John's purpose was to write a, a spiritual gospel. And we can take that as such. And I think that's the reason why there's so much theological uh, information in this, because John really wanted to present the, the, the spiritual side here. And, and so it's a very unique portrait. That's what I guess I would say in summing up. Very unique portrait of Jesus in the Gospel of John that we're going to see. So if I, if I had to divide this out very, very broadly, Matthew's portrait, uh, he presents Jesus as the Jewish Messiah. That's why there's so many Old Testament quotes in the Gospel of Matthew. Mark is very action-oriented and he presents Jesus as the suffering servant, the Messiah who came to die. Uh, Luke's portrait, a little different with a strong emphasis on the humanity of Jesus. Uh, John's portrait, though, is going to be mostly about Jesus as the Son of God. He is the divine being that reveals God the Father to us, as we're going to see in just a moment. So, in a big, broad uh, statement, the synoptic Gospels are, are focused on the kingdom of God. John focuses on the king. And if you can keep that, then you'll have the synoptics and their focus and the Gospel of John and its focus separate. And these were meant to complement each other to supplement each other. So in a big, broad context, the Gospel of John is going to be a very, very unique study for us. So again, with that stated, uh, let's dig in now to the Gospel of John itself. Uh, it's an anonymous book. All of the all of the four Gospels are anonymous. Uh, Paul began a lot of his writings. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the saints who are at, etc. Uh, this Gospel doesn't start that way. It's not in the body of the Gospel text. Uh, the Greek uh, title of it is simply According to John. And that was given to it when it was compiled and used from about uh, 200 A.D. onward. But uh, the word gospel was added later, and we just use all of that, the gospel according to John. Just know that it's not in the body of the text itself, okay? So um, you'll read that um, this uh, author... Uh, anonymous author, just understand that that's the way that it is in each of the Gospels. 
The only thing we know about the author per se is that he describes himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's in chapter 21. A couple of times it is stated. And there's lots of opinions on who was the disciple whom Jesus loved. And again, D.A. Carson and a lot, if you ever did any extended study on this, who was the author of John? That's one of those textual issues. If you want to study this some more, there's tons of stuff that's written on this. Some people suggested that it was Lazarus because in John chapter 11, Jesus is uh, overcome and somebody says, oh, how he loved him. And so some people have suggested Lazarus. Some people have suggested that it was kind of a um, description of an ideal Christian, that it wasn't a real person. And uh, so you're going to get all kinds of different opinions. What we know is this. Whoever this disciple was, it, he was an eyewitness of the details of Jesus' life. All right? He's got firsthand knowledge. He knows how many jars of water were at the wedding of Cana. He says that there were six of them. Uh, the man who was paralyzed and healed in John chapter 5, 38 years. Only a first-hand witness would know that kind of information. He gives the name of the slave. Peter cuts off his ear. The, the slave's name was Malchus. Um, in John chapter 21, they bring in a haul of fish while Jesus is on the shore. And John gives a number, 153 fish. So somebody had to be there to know all of that. Uh, this author has firsthand knowledge of Palestine and of Jerusalem. Uh, he knows Jacob's well is in Sychar. Uh, he knows about the pools of Bethesda and Siloam. Uh, he knows about uh, Solomon's colonnade in chapter 10. And then he has firsthand knowledge of all the Jewish feasts. Uh, there's language, all of the traditions here. He introduces Hebrew and Aramaic words, Rabboni, uh, Cephas, Messiah. So it's somebody who has a significant personal background in all things Jewish. So whoever the disciple whom Jesus loved, whoever it is, uh, really knew uh, the whole state of affairs that were going on in Judaism in the, in the first century. Now, suggestions. There are two primary options that are presented as to who this disciple whom Jesus loved, who, who it could have been. Uh, one of the primary views is that it was a, a John who was an elder in the church at Ephesus. Uh, Eusebius, again, 260s to the early 300s, he was uh, uh, quoting an uh, uh, early church father by the name of Papias, uh, who lived around uh, 150, 125 to 150 AD here who uh, identifies the author as um, an elder named John at Ephesus. So there was an apostle named John in Ephesus, and according to Papias, there was also an elder by the name of John. Some people think that it was this elder. And if you take into account the writings of 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, uh, that those letters are introduced uh, as being written by the elder. So it's an interesting suggestion. Some people hold to it. But an awful lot of people will hold to that this is the uh, Apostle John. Uh, Irenaeus, who was a bishop of Lyon in France, was a disciple of Polycarp. And Polycarp, uh, AD 70 to... 150 AD. Polycarp was a disciple of John the Apostle, and it was uh, uh, he who, this um, Irenaeus, who identifies, uh, says that Polycarp told him that it was John the Apostle. Uh, he lived in Ephesus. He was advanced in age here, 
And it was Clement of Alexandria, uh, Alexandria again, who said that John in Ephesus wrote this spiritual gospel here. So church tradition has assumed that it's John the Apostle. And we're going to make that same assumption here. If you want to read some more on this, you go through that uh, the introductory comments on uh, D.A. Carson's commentary. You'll see there's lots of different views. So what do we know about John the Apostle? He's the brother of James. It's always James and John. His dad's name was Zebedee. He was a fisherman. His mom's name was Salome. Uh, many people think that Salome was the sister of Mary, Jesus' mom, and that would make uh, James and John Jesus' cousins. Uh, they were followers of John the Baptist. They became followers then of Jesus. Uh, John the Apostle, he's one of the 12. He's also one of the three, the inner circle of Peter, James, and John, who are up on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, he and his brother, James and John, get a nickname. They are called the Sons of Thunder because of their personality. And then he became the Apostle of Love because of his writings here in, in the Gospels as well as the letters. Uh, um, after the resurrection and ascension, but before 70 AD, uh, John uh, took Mary with him to the city of Ephesus. Ephesus is up in the far north of western Turkey. It's a Turkish city today called Kusadasi, and uh, uh, way up in the north, right on the sea there. And that's where it says that John uh, pastored the church at Ephesus. We have the New Testament letter to the Ephesians. Uh, church tradition. One church tradition says that Mary is buried there. And so he was pastor of that church for a long time. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9, we're told that John was exiled to the island of Patmos, which is in the um, one of the Greek isles. And um, during that time here is the reign of uh, one of the Roman emperors named uh, Domitian from uh, 81 to 96 AD, and John was exiled there, got the revelation, and uh, tradition tells us he came back and died in Ephesus in 98 AD during the reign of, of Trajan, the emperor Trajan. Yeah. So he's the only one of the 12 who were not martyred. So John apparently died of natural causes. Everybody else uh, was martyred for their their Christian faith. So most people think it's the Apostle John. Uh, most people think that um, John was uh, writing this uh, somewhere between 80 to 90 AD here. So it's prior to the writing of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, prior to the writing of Revelation, but long enough after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in AD 70 that he did not sense the need to write about that destruction. So most people put it uh, towards the some, some time in this decade, but we don't know with certainty. But I think that's what the, all the external evidence kind of uh, points to. All right. Now, one of, the, one of the questions that gets asked about the Gospel of John a lot is, what was going on in Ephesus during that 80 to 90, 80 to 100 time frame that may have impacted John's writing here? Well, there are two issues, and again, you'll read about this here in, in the Carson's commentary. During this time, the Christian church had separated from the Jewish synagogue here. So the, the, the Christian church was viewed with increasing skepticism here, suspicion, by uh, the non-believing Jewish population there, as well as the secular authorities. 
And uh, in many ways, you'll read about the Johannine or John's community um, that uh, then took on the Jewish community, if you will, in theological debate and discussion here. And uh, a lot of people, when you read through the Gospel of John, one of the interesting things that you'll notice is that there are some really strong statements about the Jews. And when you first read it, uh, you kind of uh, shake your head a little bit because Jesus and the apostles were all Jews. And it seems to be there's this adversarial relationship between the Jews and Jesus and his disciples here. And uh, there are some who say that that suggests John is bringing into the gospel writing some of what was going on in his own cultural experience here and addressing some of those issues here. And so we'll talk about that when we get to it, but just know that there's some impact here. Um, the gospel of John is not anti-Semitic. It's never about race. It's never about culture. It's about reception and response to the Lord Jesus. And that's where it becomes adversarial, oppositional, if you will. That the Jews, uh, oftentimes referring to the religious leaders, especially those from Judea, from the south down in Jerusalem, as well as the Hebrew people as a whole, uh, the vast majority of them did not believe in Jesus. And so it became a very adversarial relationship. And John wrote about it here. But he's not anti-Jewish. He's not anti-Semitic in any way, shape, or form because he himself is a Jew. Uh, the other thing that, that seems to uh, be in the historic setting is this the whole uh, heresy called docetism. Uh, dokeo is the Greek verb that uh, literally translates as to appear or to seem, if you will. And uh, the, the, the docetic heresy was that Jesus was just a man who seemed like he was uh, completely human, that the Christ spirit came on him at baptism but left him uh, prior to uh, his crucifixion and death. And so uh, it, it only appeared like Jesus was human. It only appeared like he was divine, but he really wasn't. And so this whole um, emphasis that John gives about the full humanity and full deity of Christ, some would say is a, a response to what was going on during his time frame. Uh, there's another heresy that comes up um, a, a little later than the first century called Gnosticism that John writes about extensively in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. But uh, um, this uh, docetism seems to be a major if, uh, uh, issue in uh, Ephesus that John seems to write about. So just keep that in mind as, as we go through this. You'll read about this in various commentaries. Uh, just know that the Holy Spirit inspires John to write what he writes. So whether it had emphasis in the latter first century, 80 to 100 AD, or whether it was an issue of the day, 30 AD when Jesus lived, the Holy Spirit inspired all this and wants us to have it. And so we'll dig into a little bit uh, onto these two issues once we get into the text. Okay, uh, let's move on to the purpose. The purpose of the Gospel of John, uh, one of the clearest statements in all of the New Testament as to the purpose for, for its writing, is in John chapter 20 and verse 31. These things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So it's that phrase, that you may believe, that gives us really a twofold purpose in this gospel of, excuse me, this gospel of John. Uh, the first is an evangelistic purpose so that you may believe here. Um, 
the, the verb to believe, it's used 98 times in John's Gospels. And uh, it's one of his primary focus. What does it mean to believe? Because you're going to see different levels of belief in different people at different times. Is it a genuine saving belief? Or is it some kind of a spurious false belief? Is their faith true or is their faith unreliable? Does one lead to salvation but another does not? And so we're going to have lots of discussions. But John wrote so that people, when they read his gospel, would believe it, that you may believe. And so there's a very strong um, uh, evangelistic push in the gospel of John especially for Jewish people. And again, if that ties into the historic setting, he's trying to lead these Jewish people in his community to Christ. And so he's going to give the, the seven miracles here, uh, all going to identify Jesus as God the Son and call for a decision. It's the same thing with all the different theological uh, things that that uh, John speaks about. There's a number of Old Testament allusions, both explicit and implicit in the Gospel of John. You have the manna from heaven in John chapter 6 here. You have Jacob's ladder. You have in John chapter 3, the snake on the pole in the book of Numbers. So a lot of different Jewish flavors to the Gospel of John. Strong emphasis. But as in everything else that gets written, it's also for the edification of believers here. And so uh, you and I can receive great encouragement. If you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, keep on believing. Continue. And that's the whole section of abiding in Christ and everything that we're going to learn in John chapter 15 about all of this. So the twofold purpose, it's both evangelistic and it's for edification here. And it was really written to call people to a decision. Uh, there, there's not going to be any gray areas here. You're either going to decide for them or you're going to decide against them. And uh, that's the way that John's gospel is presented here. It is not a complete biography by any means at all, but he is going to use, John is going to use very specific events and not always in chronological order, but he's going to use these specific events here that best communicate Jesus' true identity as God the Son, as the Messiah, God the Son, and then to call people, make up your minds about him. All right? So, twofold purpose as we go through both evangelistic and for edification. The primary theological themes. Now, yeah, the, uh, the Gospel of John in many ways is like a precious gem uh, that you hold up to the light. And if you hold it up and you look at it, you'll get one facet of that gem. You turn it another way and a, a little bit more light, a little bit more clarity comes in, a little different perspective. That's the way that the Gospel of John is. There are different layers of understanding and meaning, and you can just go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh, because the things that he's writing about are the most marvelous truths in the world, but they are sometimes kind of mind-blowing when you stop and you think about him. And what we're going to do is we're going to highlight four during our, our study time together. The first, that Jesus is God in human flesh. That's the way John presents Jesus of Nazareth. He is the incarnate God-man. The divine and human natures were perfectly united. And so you get in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So he's distinct from the Father, but he's equal with the Father. He's an eternal being. He's the only begotten God. You're going to get all kinds of statements here about who Jesus is here. And each one of the I am statements, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, 
I am the door. I'm the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. Each one of them communicates something about his divinity. And each one is a, a, a metaphor, and it, it gives us a little deeper understanding as we start to dig in to what's a door and, and, and what, what is light and what is bread and how do we get life from it and what kind of life is he talking about. All of this wrapped up in the identity of Jesus as God in human flesh here. So we'll talk a lot about this theme. It could be one of the themes that you write about in your, in your term paper. Uh, the second theme, Jesus reveals God the Father. Uh, we'll see in our very first class when we're together, when we study the prologue, uh, the meaning of the word logos. In the beginning was the word. Well, the whole idea is that the word is God's self-revelation. And that's the reason why John 1.18, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he, Jesus, has explained him. So if we want to know anything about God the Father, we have to look at Jesus of Nazareth because he is the God-man who was sent to reveal God the Father to us. And so you're going to look at the at the seven great uh, signs, if you will, miracles. There'll be eight if you use Jesus' resurrection, nine if you include the miraculous catch of fish in chapter 21. But typically you'll hear about seven signs in the book of John, the water into, into wine, the healing of the uh, nobleman's son in chapter uh, four, the healing of the paralytic in chapter 5, you're going to see the multiplication of uh, feeding of 5,000 in chapter 6 is walking on the water in chapter 6, the blind man uh, being healed in chapter 9, the raising of Lazarus in chapter 11. Each one of those reveals something about God to us. And that's why we're going to take a look at them and we'll go through them. What, what does this tell us? What is God telling us about himself through this? Uh, a third theme, and this is, a, I, I kind of uh, brought this into, a, into one theme, but there's really four or five different themes here, uh, that Jesus gives the gift of salvation from sin and eternal life to all who believe. And he also gives judgment to all who choose unbelief here. So the gospel as we read it here uh, tells us that Jesus came to save. There's no question. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The critical thing now to see is John is going to weave conversations then of as uh, illustrations of those who believe and receive forgiveness and eternal life. It happens with Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes to a saving faith later in the gospel. Uh, it happens with the Samaritan woman. She comes to faith and believes. And the people uh, of uh, that whole area of Samaria, they come to faith and they believe. And so this gift of salvation, this gift of life comes from believing. But at the same point in time, you'll read that Jesus says, I didn't come to judge, but the very fact that people have a choice to make means that there will be judgment if they choose not to believe here. And you'll see this illustration in various narratives and conversations Jesus has, especially with the religious leaders. What does it mean to not believe? How does this work with the whole doctrine of sovereignty and election and choosing and the choosing to not believe? How do we live within that tension? Uh, Gospel of John is going to help us understand this. And the way that John does it, it's such a unique gospel, but he uses dualism is what typically is called. He uses contrasting ideas of those who choose to believe and those who choose to not believe. 
to those whom he has called and those to whom he has not called. Uh, and so you'll see these words, light and darkness. You'll see love and hate. You'll see sight and blindness. You'll see I'm from above, you are from below. Uh, I know the truth, you are filled with lies. I am of my father God, you are of your father the devil. I am not of this world, you are of this world. And so you get these contrasting views. How do these work? Uh, light and darkness. Why does someone stay in darkness rather than responding to the gospel? So we're going to talk a lot about this. this uh, again, this idea of believing is the key. And then the fourth theme is all about the Holy Spirit. He's our advocate. He's our counselor. He's our our, our guide into all the truth. Uh, he empowers the greater works in John chapter 14. Uh, he mediates Jesus' presence with us while Jesus is in heaven. So there's lots of things that we'll talk about in this whole Holy Spirit ministry. And as you read through um, Carson's commentary and you focus in on the purpose and you focus in on themes, this will really help you understand a little bit more of some of the, the facets and the different layers and levels that you'll be able to take a look at. And uh, we'll do some uh, thinking, hopefully deep thinking about what these truths are. All right, the, the key verse, uh, you, you pick a number of them, but John 3.16 is a good summation. Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And you'll notice there that um, uh, the translation is not the only begotten. Uh, Monogenes, the Greek word, uh, not best translated uh, begotten. It's about a uniqueness, and so his one and only son, probably a way better translation, point being that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So this is out of the NIV, and if you'd like to memorize that, I'm sure all of you have, uh, that's one of them. Okay, so here's the outline that we're going gonna to follow. Uh, you'll see in many different works, a uh, little different outline, a little uh, simpler outline. Uh, everybody agrees that chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 18 are about the prologue. Uh, it's about the incarnation and the Son of God. It goes all the way back to before time began, in the beginning. And that connects us in many ways back to Genesis 1-1. In the beginning was the Word. So that's the the prologue, the incarnation. And then uh, from chapter 1, verse 19, all the way through the end of chapter 4, you're going to see the presentation of the Son of God. So it's, this is all going to be about the Son of God everywhere that you go. Uh, you're going to read about, uh, and then chapter 5 through 12, the opposition to the Son of God. Uh, during our uh, intensive week, where we'll divide this section into two different sections on two different days. There's so much material in it. But you get the incarnation, the presentation, the opposition. You're, you're going to get the instruction in, in chapters 13 through 17, where Jesus focuses in on the disciples and what they need to know because he's going to be leaving them. He's going to die. He'll be buried. He'll rise from the dead and then ascend back to heaven. And here's what he needed them to know. Uh, then chapters 18 and 19, to large extent, are the execution of the Son of God. The resurrection, the end of chapter 19 through chapter 20. And then there's an epilogue, uh, conclusion, if you will, on the dedication to the Son of God. And that's uh, all of, of chapter 21. Uh, you'll read, I was mentioning a sim simpler outline. Some people will give the prologue, then the Book of Signs, S-I-G-N, S is the Book of Signs. Uh, then the Book of Glory, chapters 13 through 20. 
and they'll call it the book of glory because Jesus likens his death and burial, resurrection to his glorification. And so they call it the book of glory. And then uh, they'll conclude with an epilogue. But I wanted to use this little uh, broader outline for you because my hope is at some point in time you'll teach through this or you'll speak uh, to other people through this. And then if you want to focus in on the presentation of Jesus, on the opposition, etc., then you'll have some uh, broader areas that you can go back to. Okay? Okay, let me give you just one concluding illustration, if I can. If, if I have a goal for our time together, it's this. What I hope to do, and what I hope that you will do during this time, is drink deeper. And I want to give you just a, a quick illustration of that. Here's, I just brought a bowl with uh, some water in it. And uh, as you can see it here, uh, this bowl with water, and it has a sponge in it. And we're all pretty familiar. I don't know if that's loud in the recording. Sorry about that. Uh, the point being is that we all know what a sponge does. It soaks up water. And once it gets fully soaked, then you just kind of squeeze it out. Let me make sure I get this in, right? You just squeeze it out, and the water comes out. Well, here's what happens in the Christian life, what I've noticed a lot of times. A lot of Christian people will approach it like, like a sponge. And if we don't take the time to drink deeply of the truths of God's Word, I mean, really sit with them, to think about them, the Bible uses the term meditates on them, you uh, review them in your mind and in your heart over and over again. If we don't do that, something uh, happens to us where we get confused. I affectionately call it stinking thinking. starts to get us. Where we think that our relationship with Christ is based upon what we do more than what he's done for us. And I've noticed a lot of Christians that they start to think, oh, I just need to get better. If I don't feel close to the Lord, I guess I just got to do more. I have to study more. I have to pray more. And so what ends up happening is they start squeezing more and more and more of the sponge, hoping to get more water out of it. And so they squeeze harder and harder and harder ah, but it's not working we don't get any closer the harder that we try and this is where a lot of Christian people are, are kind of stuck in their walk with God God's not close seems like he's far away and people say what's wrong with me everybody else seems to be doing so good what's wrong I'm just uh, I gotta do better I gotta do more I, oh, I just gotta and the whole point of it, the whole point of it is at some point in time, the, the harder that you squeeze, you ultimately get to the place where you sit there and you think, I'm just a bad sponge. Everybody else can do this. I guess that's just the way that it's supposed to be. I don't feel real close to the Lord. I don't talk with him much. I don't hear from him. He doesn't interact that much with me. And I guess that's just the way that it is. And we we get stuck and we kind of fake it, if you will. And there's a lot of Christians that are doing that, just thinking, oh, I'm just so bad and I just gotta, ah, I just gotta do more. I gotta try harder and harder. Listen, God's not opposed to effort. What he's opposed to is earning, you see? And this is where this whole idea of drink deeper comes in. And it's really in many ways, the theme for the year for Calvary Chapel Bible College. It, it, it's going to always start with drinking deeper of these truths that we're going to see in the Gospel of John, that we are loved, and God proved it by the giving of his Son, for God so loved. And what I and you and we need to do is not do better. We need to start by drinking deeper. And the more that we take in the truths of God's Word, the more we're able then to 
squeeze it out. But what, what happens is we forget to take it in. And I really want this to be what the Gospel of John in this class is all about. It's about us drinking deeper and taking it in and, and really into our hearts of God's love and God's plan and God's purpose for our lives. And if we do that, boy, we will really draw closer to the Lord. And that's my hope and my prayer for you during this time. So I'll leave you with this. I'll leave you with this quote from Leonard Ravenhill. I really, there's a difference between knowing the word of God and knowing the God of the word. Understand that and the religious people of Jesus, they, they knew the word of God backwards and forwards. But we're going to see John chapter 80. He's going to say, you don't know the word because you don't know my father. So that they knew about him, but they never drank deeply. And as a result, they did not know God. And that's what I really, really want to emphasize. I want you to get to know the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit better and better in your mind, but also in your experience with him, in your heart. And that's going to require that we stop and we think, how am I doing with the Lord? How's my walk with the Lord now? And what do I need to do to keep growing? Because some of you are doing great, keep going. If you're stuck, welcome to the club. It happens to all of us. But the, the, I hope in the discussion board questions that you'll have the opportunity to interact honestly and truthfully and then find some support and some encouragement through our time together. So, okay. Thanks very much for listening here. If you've got any questions, uh, uh, either uh, text me, email me, and I'll do my very, very best to get back to you. Okay? All right. Our Father in heaven, thank you again. Thank you for your love. And we, we do want to just drink it in today. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. Such we are. And we praise you and thank you. I want to just drink it in and pray through your Holy Spirit that this day, this offering of thanks would be pleasing to you. And uh, we'll trust you, Lord, that you through your spirit and your word will speak. So give blessing to my sisters and brothers in Christ and my life again today. We want to honor you in all that we do. So hear our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you. And I really will look forward to seeing you face to face. All right, take care.